Good evening and welcome to the select board meeting for February 12th, 2024. I am Eric Eldridge, the chair. Uh, this meeting, the following meeting is being recorded and broadcast by Tingsboro Media. The meeting is available through our local cable access channels on Comcast and Verizon Fios and is a live stream on our new website, www.tingsboroma.gov. A recording of this meeting will be available through the video on demand portion of our website. Open meeting laws require that any member of the audience who intends on recording either video or audio so declare that now. Seeing none, after instruction from the state fire marshal and the Tingsboro fire chief in the event of an emergency, there is an exit directly across from me at the rear of the room and one to my left. With that, I ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And uh, when we do board introductions, I'll start from my left. Good evening, Jacqueline Schnecker, Executive Assistant. Good evening, Ron Schneider. Good evening, Ron Cohane. Uh, good evening, Mike Moran, Vice Chair. Good evening, Katerina Kalabokas. Good evening, Colin Loisel, Town Manager. Good evening, Catherine Foster, Assistant Town Manager. Okay, um, just a quick note, I'll be slight change on the agenda. We're gonna push the town manager's report to happen right before new business. So with that, uh, why don't we hop into the agenda? Can I get a motion on meeting minutes? I move that the select board approve the regular session meeting minutes for January 29th, 2024. Chair, I second that. I have a motion in the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? That carries five zero zero. Executive session meeting minutes for review, approval, but not release. I move that the select board, <coughs> excuse me, I move that the select board approve but not release the executive session minute meetings for January 29th, 2024. I second that. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? That carries 500. Okay, citizen and business time. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to address the board? Seeing none. Okay, why don't we go to item number five. This is uh, Jushi, request for extension of hours for 420 Middlesex Road. If um, sure. you want them to come on up. Yeah, uh, you wanna come up, I can. Just come on up here to the, this table right here, Ronnie. Right here. Right. Uh, I can tee this one up, Mr. Chair, Please if you'd do. like. Uh, before the board this evening is Jushi doing business as nature's remedy. Um, we have representatives from the local store here in the board's meeting room. Also joining us virtually is Matt Leith, who's counsel for Jushi. Uh, as the board is aware, our police department uh, and Chief Howe is here tonight as well, so is Deputy Chief Woods, has been working closely with nature's remedy over the last couple of months to address increasing traffic concerns with the location at 420 Middlesex Road. Some of those concerns that we've been working to address include pedestrians crossing uh, the four lanes of traffic on Middlesex Road, lines of vehicles waiting to make a right-hand turn into the parking lot, which causes traffic backups toward the 440 Plaza, and vehicles making a dangerous left-hand turn out of the parking lot toward Nashua. Nature's Remedy has taken steps at the recommendation of the police chief to address those concerns, including implementing a shuttle program for employees to free up parking, a focus on scheduled pickups in an attempt to control peak times, and agreeing to hire police details during peak business hours. On top of that, they are before the board this evening seeking permission to amend their hours of operation in a further attempt to spread out the business and thus hopefully alleviate some of the traffic concerns. Including your packet is the proposed hours. You can see that currently Monday to Thursday, they're open 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday to Saturday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., and on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. They're looking for a very modest increase to their operating hours. So the new hours would be Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So adding an hour to either end of the day. On Friday to Saturdays, they'd be looking to open 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there's no proposed change for Sunday's hours. While the host community agreement with Nature's Remedy doesn't include their operating hours, it was included in the initial presentation they gave to the board when you were selecting businesses to open in Tingsboro. So, um, they reached out and asked if they could come before you to get your blessing. 
The board could approve the request this evening on an understanding that future requests would need to come back to the select board as they've shown they're willing to do. Um, and certainly if there are questions about other measures they've taken, we have representatives from the company here and also the police chief. And I don't know, Matt, if, you, if, if I summarize that well, if you want to add anything. Uh, yes, thank you, Colin. And in fact, you, you summarize it extremely well. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add there. We are making other efforts to uh, mitigate sort of our peak hour demands. Uh, we have found, you know, at other stores and other uh, municipalities that adding a couple of hours, particularly towards, you know, the Friday and Saturday, uh, but any day um, helps, frankly, just give customers you know, wider windows to, to come to the store. So it's less about generating more revenue and more about spreading out the demand throughout the day. So we do expect this to be effective. Excellent. Great. Um, I guess, um, Chief Howd, um, I'd love to get your opinion on some of the items and some of the key things. I think over here, this is, you've got a microphone over here. Um, if perhaps you could weigh in on some of the particulars, and I know you provided some recommendations to us, and I want to make sure that those are highlighted and considered as, as part of this. Sure. Yeah, we um, so we've met a couple times over the last uh, several weeks, uh, month. Obviously, um, you just spelled out what the issue is, building up down Middlesex Road. They've been very uh, open with the conversations. Uh, you know, one of the suggestions, um, in addition to the expansion of hours, which I'm glad to see they're here doing this tonight, is um, we made a recommendation of a physical barrier to force a right-hand turn which is a huge deal. They have limited space in the parking lot, and uh, if you look at it when it's busy, it's just, it becomes compact in there. Not to mention the safety issue. We have had some motor vehicle accidents, um, you know, that have not been uh, too serious yet, but obviously my concern is it's just a matter of time before we have something more serious. So you can picture traffic building up in that right-hand lane. It's, now it's blind. You've got cars going on the left. In the, in the second lane that's open, and now you have cars trying to sneak out, and they're working their way out to take a left-hand turn. I've come down that road, the same thing's happened. So uh, working with them on that, I, that, is a, that is a big issue. I've, I've expressed that, uh, you know, I really uh, would like them to take a hard look at it. They are, uh, they have assured me of that. We'll be, we plan to follow up at some point soon. Um, they've also started that program um, that I think they've seen some modest returns on as far as uh, employees parking off-site. I think they'd like to uh, look into a potential of expanding the parking lot uh, to bring their employees on-site, but that's, I think that's another, um, another situation. So all those things combined, police details are not the first thing that we recommend. Uh, in fact, they're the last because we can't always promise that we can fill them, to be quite honest. Uh, but they have been requesting details uh, on uh, a couple weekends and, um, you know, at least in the short term, I see that happening. And, and you know, we had a, a pretty frank conversation regarding the second uh, company coming in and that is going to help. They've acknowledged the same thing. That's going to help alleviate um, a, a lot of this issue, uh, we, we assume. So. Great. Thank you. Um, so before I open up to the rest of the board, I, I mean, I, I did want to make sure there's a couple things, having, having driven down there and seeing some of that, um, my concern definitely is that right-hand turn. I think making sure that the employees don't have to cross Middlesex Road, you know, I, I worry about, you know, somebody 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, they finish their shift, and um, we, you know, safety is paramount. And so... Um, making sure that they have a place to park where they can be safe and not have to go across that um, is really important. So I appreciate the hours. I appreciate, you know, extending some of those things. I don't think that this runs into a situation where it's really late, but I do think that the, the right-hand turn is critical and making sure that, um, you know, the employees don't have to cross those four lanes. Um, so... I guess I, if I could just add to sure. we did also have a conversation regarding several of the issues but to include literature with their own customers whether by email uh, customer contact reach out um, in the literature encouraging uh, the importance of first of all taking a right out of there uh, staying on their scheduled pickup times uh, not to sit on Middlesex Road if it's backed up 
um, call the store if necessary, but sitting on Middlesex Road waiting to turn in is not an acceptable practice. So uh, I think that's being, my understanding that's being worked on as well. Great yeah. thing. Anything that you wanted to add? Yes, yeah, so to his point, uh, we do have uh, handouts that we've been providing customers. So every bag that leaves our door, gets that gets stapled on there. And essentially just encourages them, please take a right turn. Let's, you know, reminds them that it's against the law. And also provides an alternative route. So if you are taking a right, there's a way to kind of get back on the highway that way. Uh, so we've been doing our part on that end and making sure that's posted throughout the entire store as well as also putting it on the customer bags too. But yeah, definitely on the same page with everything for sure. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll, I'll open it up to, to the rest of the board. Um, Mr. Schneider, did you want to start us off? Um, yeah, no, I'm glad to hear that, that you're, you're forcing them, to, or you're, you're hopefully forcing them to take right-hand turns. But what about the, the left-hand turn for people coming northbound on Middlesex Road? Is, is there anything being done to address that, or is that? It's, it's a good point. Um, the honest answer is no, not at this time. Um, I know that the state is talking about an intersection. I don't know how far off uh, that is, uh, and, and that would go a long way to obviously s slow down or stop the traffic in that area. Um, I think that's preliminary stage. You probably know more than I do about that. Um, I know there's been some conversations, and I haven't seen where that is actually landing. So maybe Colin has something to add on that one. So I don't know. I think that it's still in the traffic study um, phase with MassDOT. But, you know, that, even that left turn, again, is exasperated by the fact that it's building up on the other side. Right. So if we can eliminate that, I feel, the, you know, we're, we're mitigating the entire issue. If we can eliminate that back up on the right side, the other, the northbound traffic, it becomes safer as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Colleen? <clears throat> so we're talking about taking, you know, the issue is taking, you know, hopefully letting them take a right out of the parking lot. Um, and I know you have a police police detail. I don't know what can the officer do to to help um, encourage them to take a right. I guess. Well, I think with an officer there, um, in essentially directing them to take a right, I think that's problem solved when they're there. But it's not a long term solution. Obviously, having a police officer there all the time. Is that where they're at? They're at. Where is the police officer? Uh, the police officer, I believe, has been uh, with the cruiser um, and. Um, been at the entrance and, the entrance, and okay. helping out uh, with the egress and you know going into the business. So, okay, yeah. thank you. And the, oh. the, f the feedback has been it, it is working. Yeah. It does help when there's a police officer there, but <laughs> it's fantastic. So the question I have is, I know that um, you probably do orders online, people to show up. You can also add that to the communications thing. Hey, we're reinforcing just a blurb. Take a right yeah. turn. Take a right turn. Take a right turn. Because the safety, obviously, of everybody on those intersections is the highest priority. Um, that's really just my only concern is the right versus left-hand turn. Because I've, I go to the mall, I go to Tavern and Square, I do all that stuff. So, uh, yeah. you know, I have to deal with somebody trying to cut left, and it's like, oh my God! So I want to try to help avoid that. But yeah. again, it's over communicating with the clients, and then if there's ever the opportunity to add that barrier. I think is really smart. Yeah, hundred percent. We do also have the option to put banners on our website, so we can always go ahead and you know yep. uh, add more communication on the site as well, um, just so that people placing pre-orders kind of already have that anticipated you know knowledge of okay, I shouldn't take a left when I'm leaving. So, It'd be funny about it too. Do you want a ticket <laughs> or a yeah, good time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. It's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thank you, Katerina. Um, well, thank you for coming in today. So I've seen the backup as well, but I've never actually pulled in or out of your um, parking lot. When you're coming out, is there, can you explain to me what the signage looks like? Yes, so we have a stop sign uh, exiting the lot, and then right underneath that stop sign is a no left turn sign. Um, we have had conversations in the past about adding more signage to that. Um, we have an extra no left turn sign at the store right now mm -hmm. that we're able to utilize as well, but I believe we have to go through MassDOT in order to get all that approved. Um, so that's something that we're talking about as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I will say when you get to that stop sign, sometimes it isn't really easy to see that no left turn. So I think it's a combination of people not seeing it, and then some people do see it and they just kind of ignore it. Uh, but I do think more signage would, would assist us with that for sure. Yeah. Okay. 
And I know that um, Chief Howe had talked about having conversations with you about a barrier. Could you explain a little bit to me what that would look like? It would kind of force people to go? Yeah, so I believe the idea is they were, uh, I think it was like the plastic sort of cones that kind of stay stationed uh, where, you know, you can kind of bump them, but they don't really damage the cars. I think that's the direction we're going in. Um, it's still kind of a, a, a little bit of a new conversation, a little fresh, so I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen with that. Uh, but there was talks about, you know, kind of creating something where you're forced to take a right turn and you can't take a left turn even if you tried, essentially. So that's what we're, we're working towards. If I could just add, th Please. they did talk to me about the second sign and um, I wasn't, I'm not a big fan of signs, and it's not that I'm against having signage, it just, it doesn't really improve things. People are going to turn if they're going to turn. It's the physical barrier that it comes down to, um, that you really need to force that behavior, and, and, and I know that the sign's there, and they let me know, and they emailed me that they had a second sign, and they wanted to put it up, and whereas the state road, we, we have some issues with that, um, they have to reach out to DOT and, and work through that, but regardless, it's probably not going to really help mitigate the situation anymore it might make everybody feel a little bit better but it's really not going to the results not going to be uh, any different so uh, i'm really hopeful that they can employ some kind of physical barrier in place that will make an enormous difference yeah. i i think just on the the physical barrier one i think simpler example um the honeydew on westford road to encourage you to take a right out of the honeydew instead of crossing the, I think it's only three lanes, but and taking the left, their median that separates the entrance portion and the exit, it's not um, like a physical barrier that you couldn't go over, but the way that the curb is designed, if you're going to try to take a left, you're going to go over the curb, and it's very obvious that you need to take a right. So that's less of a, you know, structural barrier that may get in the way of like a fire truck trying to respond or something, but still guides people to say like, you've got to take a right. Right, especially so if you have like one way in, one way out, right. and the one way out is curved, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I think that that would be helpful um, because I, I do think expanded hours is going to help alleviate a little bit, but I think to Chief's point, people are going to do what, what yeah. they want to do, right, unless there's that physical barrier there. So my hope would be, especially if we're expanding to like 9, 10 p.m. on summer weekends and things, you know, it can get busy there, um, the hope would be that we seriously consider this barrier okay. um, sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. That's all if, I, if I may, I apologize, I can't, can't see you guys, so I'm a little awkward in, in that <laughs> regard. Uh, but I'll just confirm, uh, we are looking into the, the physical barriers that the, the tubular delineators, um, we do need a, we're still tracking down a mass doc uh, uh, contact. Uh, so frankly, Colin, I, I'll follow up with you this week. Maybe someone in, in the town can assist. Sure. Um, because it's DOT uh, right of way, uh, we're very you know, trepidatious about adding any physical barriers without buy-ins. Yep. Um, I've spoken to civil roadway engineers, and the, the tune should not be an issue, but we do need mass dots approval. Um, but we think that would be effective, and it wouldn't you know, create any heightened crash risk if, if cars did hit it at speed. Great. Excellent. You good? I'm all set. Thank right. you very much. Um, Thank you. Does, um, I, we didn't really talk too much about it, briefly touch upon it. Is everybody good with the hours, um, the expansion? Anybody have any concerns about that? I'm seeing... I'm seeing none, so I just want to, I want to make sure, because I know we were no talking about the safety issues first, but I did want to make sure that we covered that. Um, okay, well, do you need a vote from us in order to approve that? Do we have a, do we have a motion that we can? I think if you just move to accept the hour changes as presented. And uh, previously, I think you said, if they want to change it again, they need to come, come back. back. Yeah. So the motion would be to accept the hours and to, um, if there are further changes, that they would come back in front of us? So moved. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? That carries 5 zero, zero. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. We appreciate you working with us. Um, Absolutely. Let's keep on it. Uh, I think we all have common goals to, to make sure that uh, people's experience is good and that they're safe. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. You disconnected your phone from the meeting. Okay. Now, let's do the town manager's report. Certainly. I'm, are you thrilled? I'm so thrilled. I'm not <laughs> using any of those words now. 
Um, <laughs> all right, well, I'm happy to share that Tingsboro has once again been accepted into the Commonwealth's Municipal Cybersecurity Awareness Grant Program. It's a great program we've participated in now at least two prior years, um, in addition to this one, and it provides direct education to our staff and anybody, frankly, that has a Tingsboro MA email address. Um, it helps incorporate realistic drills, so they send um, you know, fake phishing attempts, but also I think it really does a great job at reinforcing the caution that staff have to use when it comes to cybersecurity. So kudos to Tom for that. The Town Center Footbridge project is moving along nicely. Last week they installed the foundations for the observation deck and are looking to construct the deck this week. We also cleared a major hurdle with MassDOT last week. Um, they had been applying vehicular bridge standards to our pedestrian bridge way out of bounds um, we've spent weeks fighting them on this they've come around they acknowledged last week that perhaps a four-lane traffic bridge is different than our tiny pedestrian bridge and so we've gotten the approval to move forward we do have to we're still working with time bond to redesign the bridge abutments we were originally planning on doing helical piles but there's just too much stone and other debris down there um, so time bond is looking at doing some more shallow foundations, which will reduce the cost, but also eliminate the challenges that we faced with the helical piles. So I expect to get a draft design, a redesign, if you will, at some point this week, and we're still totally on track to complete this by sometime late March, early April. Same budget, you hope? It is the same budget. We had a frank conversation with Time Bond. Our, our opinion is that Time Bond designed a project that didn't work, and so it's on them to design something that does work. And we've used Time Bond before. I have no reason to believe that they'll not honor that, um, but that's where it was. They did helical pile testing before they did the design and said it would work, and we drilled 14, and one worked. So not ideal. But, yes, yeah, same budget, not asking for any money. Thank you. Um, congratulations to the Fire Department and Assistant Chief Sands on being awarded a $19,000 grant from the Department of Fire Services through the Firefighter Equipment Grant that will help them replace radio equipment. Um, they have, they've obtained funding through this grant program for the last five years. Some years they use it for equipment for the trucks, some times they use it for the ambulance service, um, but we've been very successful with fire service grants. Last week, our Finance Director David Andrews and I met with the Bond Council to talk about the middle school borrowing and discuss plans for our final permanent bond. Um, the good news is that we have several options and we're on track to not experience the first impact in terms of payments until fiscal 26. They're working as we speak to put together a couple different models for our review, but a big factor obviously will be the interest rates um, and we don't want to move forward with the permanent borrowing in today's market, although we do have reason to believe that those will come down. So all positive news there. We started working with Recreation Director Allison Page, who also I will note is celebrating 20 years with the town this week. So congratulations to Allison and to us. Um, to design the future uses of the new clubhouse, which is located on the donated parcel of land on Sherburn Ave. We walked through the building last week with Paul Welcome. It is ready for us to accept. They've done a fantastic job and included in the report are some of the photos that we took. There's a handful of very minor things they've got to address on the exterior of the building. All of it has to be done in the warmer weather, so before we recommend that you accept the building, we'll have a written agreement with them. They're aware of the issues, they pointed them out to us, um, and like I said, Paul Welcome is looked at and we don't have any, any major concerns. A lot of it's painting, honestly. I will have an update under new business, but once the open space parcel is ready for us to accept, the board is already authorized by town meeting to accept the deed, we'll take ownership, and then Right now, what we're talking about is what the use of that building will look like. We're thinking it'll be more of a community-type use building, um, and obviously, depending on what amenities end up there, we have a good idea right now, there may be some other storage uses for it. In probably the most exciting news of the day, the new town website launched today. Um, it's fantastic. Big congratulations to IT Director Tom LaFlame, and I know Roni also have played a hand in designing it. Kat was on the design team as well. Um, the website, I think, presents all the information that residents are looking for in a much more concise and clear way. Our last website did, it, did what we wanted it to do, but we outgrew it quite quickly. Um, this comes with a lot of great new features. We're already looking at how we can implement those. One thing I did want to notice is that the agenda and minutes are going to appear a lot different on this website. That's what people look for the most. So you will now find all of the information for a meeting in the calendar. So if you go back to 
your January 29th calendar meeting or calendar event, you'll find your minutes tomorrow morning. And there's an agenda center and a minute center, which connects it all. So the packet, the agenda, and the minutes will always be together, which will make looking for that information a lot easier. And we've moved almost all of your historical minutes and packets already onto this new website. So everything that you could possibly want is there. I did want to note that if you were previously subscribed to any of the lists on tingsboroughmay.gov, we've migrated those lists over. So you'll still be subscribed. You can visit the website at any time. There's a button prominently in the middle for you to amend your subscriptions. You can add subscribe to new things or unsubscribe if you were feeling necessary. And finally, just a reminder that the Massachusetts presidential primary will take place on March 5th. The deadline to register vote is Saturday, February 24th. And again, we have a link prominently on the website which will describe where you vote, how to vote, and also include sample ballots. That is all that I have, Mr. Chair. Do we, why don't we go, I know Kat's been patient, so why don't, if you go through yours and we can open up if anybody has questions or comments. I only have a couple of things. Okay. As part of the development of our regional safety action plan called Greater Lowell Vision Zero, members of the public are encouraged to attend a virtual public forum on February 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. Our project consultant, WPS, will present our region's high injury crashes and high risk networks. Vision Zero plans to utilize a data-driven approach, emphasize equity, and present a shift from traditional transportation planning. The new strategy will emphasize a more human-centered approach that acknowledges that humans make mistakes and that we can make roads safer by improving design and planning for human error. So members of the public are uh, encouraged to participate in the virtual meeting. Um, they do ask that you register in advance. The link is included in the town manager's report, but it is also posted on news and alerts on the website as well. Unfortunately, it's a little too late to post a neighbor to neighbor at this point. And related, we are encouraging members to also uh, submit or complete a survey that solicits feedback from, public, from the public on regional safety issues. The public can enter in, enter specific locations, add comments, and propose roadway improvements. Our consultant will use that data to inform project selection and propose roadway improvements for Tingsboro and the region. Uh, at, the link is included in the report. It's not yet on the town website, but we'll be posting that soon. And that's all I have. Excellent. Thank you for the updates. I'll open it up to the board. Questions or comments? Anybody want to start? No, nope, it's pretty thorough. So no questions. Lots of stuff happening. <coughs> and relative to the website, um, you did have on there that if, if people have comments, they can post it to the tech, uh, tech at Tingsboro MA. Yes. Do, be working out the kinks and but soliciting feedback from people just to, if you can't find something, that's where they should go. Yes, and we'll also be working with IT to post tutorials, so some of the more frequently found things. The great thing about Civic Plus is they design almost every other municipality's website in the Commonwealth, so they are very intuitive, they're very easy to navigate, but we will be posting, you know, we'll have a graphic specifically helping people find the meeting agendas because it's looking, it looks a little bit different. Um, minutes and etc. So certainly tech at tingsboroughma.gov help us make the website work for you. Excellent. Any other? All right. Well, thank you. And folks, uh, this will be on social media and it'll be on the website for your the synopsis of, of your updates, which are, I find are helpful for people. Mr. Chair, I totally forgot to give a late breaking update that I am thrilled to share. Please. Thanks to Roni, not only is the town manager update available in video form on YouTube, it is also now available as a podcast wow. on Spotify and anywhere else that you listen to podcasts except for Amazon right now. Okay. So if you're bored driving, you've got a long commute, you want to listen to our voices, you can do that on Spotify now. Excellent. So thank wow. you, Roni, if you're still back there. High tech and and Yes. Just a tremendous service. We did everybody. just learn it is the highest subscribed to podcast on Spotify. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. But I, I, know, I was trying no to be humble. <laughs> have no doubt on that either. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you for that late breaking update. Uh, okay, new business. We've got uh, review slash, we're just reviewing, right? The yes. Sherburn Open Space. 
Um, you, are you going to give us that one? Absolutely. This will Take be it away. this will be a quick one. I had this on the agenda in case we had a resolution to some of the outstanding issues. As you may remember, part of the Zoning Board of Appeals special permit for the Toll Brothers project limited the number of occupancy permits they could get prior to us accepting the open space parcel, which includes the building. Um, they are looking to now exceed that occupancy, and they are ready to do so. Unfortunately, there, are still, there is still one large lingering issue on that parcel, and that is what to do with the water. Um, Flooding issues over there, knock on wood, have been better, but the, the end result of a bunch of solutions they've tried is that the water is still going through an underground culvert to the town's portion, which town staff aren't tremendously concerned about so long as there's a recorded plan for maintaining it. These things aren't just something you can put in and then not worry about it. As we've seen with the culverts that we've been having to replace, they are pricey. And so our staff convened a meeting with um, Attorney DeShanes and Toll Brothers last Thursday and have agreed that Toll Brothers will submit to the town for our review and approval a maintenance plan for this culvert and, retain, and um, uh, retention pond and clarify whether through the deed or for agreement between the town and the homeowners association that the financial responsibility for maintaining that system would be on the homeowners association. Our town engineer reviewed it. The conservation commission, um, the conservation agent has reviewed it, as has the town planner. And from a town perspective, we're good with that. But until we see that in writing, and until it's executed, I wouldn't recommend that the board accept the the deed. Town council has reviewed the deed. It's a standard deed. It covers everything that we expected. But we just want to make sure we get something in writing first. So I expect that I'll be formally asking for your approval and acceptance of the deed on February 26th. Questions, comments from anyone? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any idea when you'll get that in writing? I expect probably tomorrow or Wednesday they are jumping to get the 16th occupancy permit, so I don't expect sure. there'll be a delay. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Okay, um, let's talk uh, request to opt out of mail in vote for town election. This is a public hearing, so. <laughs> Can we open the public hearing first, please? I move that the select board open the public hearing and waive the reading of the hearing notice and the legal ad. I second it. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 5 0, zero. Public hearing is open. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, if you could sure. take us through it. Just, Absolutely. Just in case somebody does show up, but. Please. Sure. Including your packet this evening is a request from Town Clerk Joanne Schiffer seeking the board's vote <clears throat> to opt out of mail-in voting only for the May 2024 annual town election. This does not apply to the presidential primary. It doesn't apply to the state primary in the fall or the general election in November. It's only the town election. The Votes Act, which authorizes mail-in voting, was passed shortly after town meeting adopted its series of voting reforms here in Tingsboro. And it does include a provision that allows the select board or the city council in a city to opt out of mail-in voting for the local election only. It's a one-time opt-out, so if you opt out this time, it'll only be for the May 2024 annual town election, and the May 2025 election will include mail-in voting unless you choose to opt out. Um, it does require that we have a public hearing, which is why you open the public hearing. We noticed this separately from the agenda on the town's website and social media. The, the memo from Joanne is attached, um, but in short, she points out the challenges particularly facing this year, and, and two of the big ones are mail-in voting is already in full swing for the presidential primary happening in February, or in March, I'm sorry. We've already sent out roughly 1,500 ballots, and so for folks that aren't familiar, mail-in voting for any election now is when the Secretary of State's office sends to every registered voter in a municipality an application to vote by mail. All the voter has to do is check, yes, I want to vote, and pick the elections. You put your application in a prepaid return envelope. It goes to your local town hall, and then the town clerk has to process that. We mail you out a ballot. You've got to mail it back. It seems like a simple process, but it does take five to ten minutes um, once you've received it, and it's about three to five minutes to send it out. This is different from absentee voting, which... Anybody's entitled to for all the elections, including a local election. 
The key difference is that for absentee voting, you have to proactively apply to vote absentee. So no one will automatically mail you an absentee ballot. You can get that, that application on our website or at the town clerk's office. You can complete it and mail it back, fax it back, or scan it back. You can also hand deliver it. And if you hand deliver it, you can even cast your absentee ballot, ballot in person. So all that this board would be voting to opt out of is the part where the Secretary of State's office sends a vote by mail application to every registered voter in Tingsboro, and your vote would be just for May 2024. Um, I did talk to, to Joanne this morning. She confirmed that there will still be 32 hours of early voting, and so that's anybody, regardless of why, can come into town hall during those 32 hours, which will populate the website shortly with those dates, and vote in person. You don't have to mail anything. It'll be just like you're voting on election day. That will still happen regardless of this. And I will note that our website, uh, the new website, is currently updated. It includes the absentee ballot application, instructions on how to request an absentee ballot, and um, contact information for not just the town clerk, but also the voting division at the Secretary of State's office if people have questions. So the memo is pretty clear. Um, the second big thing is that um, we are coming up on a town election where the position of town clerk is also up for election. And so given all of these circumstances, Joanne's memo to the board essentially says that the timing isn't right for this particular mail-in um, mail process. I will know the board has seen you received um, at least one submitted written comment that came through our office as well. It's included in the packet from a resident who is supporting the request to opt out of mail-in voting. And I believe we received other emails that were similar in support yes. of that. I think there were <coughs> at least six or seven of those <coughs> in addition to the one that, that you may have received or went to your office. Um, is there anybody in the public who would like to weigh in on this one? Okay, seeing none, um, do we wanna just close the public hearing and then we can, you guys good with that? I'm good with that. Excellent. I move that the select uh, yeah, if I would just if the board is prepared to make a decision tonight, I would close the public hearing. If you're not, we have to keep that open. So all right, I guess the question is, do we think we can make a decision on this one? Do people feel comfortable that get enough info? I'm ready. I do. After our yes. deliberations. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. I move that the select board close the public hearing. I second that. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, it carries five zero zero. Okay, deliberations. Why don't we start with you? Did you want to start on this side? I just had a few questions just to make sure that we're Please. all very, very clear. Yes. So um, for the town election, if somebody did want to vote in person, how much time do we have before and after work hours, like the traditional nine to five? There will be at least one Saturday because similar to the February 24th Saturday deadline to register to vote, mm -hmm. the deadline for the Maytown election will also be a Saturday. So the Saturday 14 days before that yeah. would be one. And then town hall's late hours on Wednesdays when we're open until 7 okay. would also be an option. And that's on top of people getting the stuff mailed to them. Perfect. And then if somebody did want to vote via absentee ballot, what would be the date for them to have the cutoff to order? It's actually a close cutoff. You can do it until noon the day before the election. Understanding that if you, if you send your request in the day before, likely the mail won't get to you in time, but you could come into town hall at 1130 the day before the election and vote absentee. Absolutely. Okay, got it. I just wanted to make sure that all of that was very clear. Thank you. And then the, the election hours we have set for election day, mm -hmm. It, that does not stop at five o'clock. That has nothing Correct. to do with town, so that there would also be that. Okay. Anything else? Nope. That's it. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Mr. Murray. Uh, no, I don't need questions or clarifications. I understand the issue. Well, <clears throat> I'm ready. Okay. Any questions, comments? Uh, oh, just kind of a comment. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> when this first came up, you know, I, I wanted to truly understand the difference between mail-in voting and whatever. And, and mail-in voting did come in just in the past two or three years. And really what we're voting on tonight is, you know, from an absentee aspect, 
this is what we've been used to for decades, right? If you want an absentee ballot, you request it, and then at that point, you could mail it in. Uh, what is also, what is new though, uh, is the early voting, which the residents voted for, overwhelmingly voted, voted for, which is 32 hours of early voting. So I'm very glad uh, that our town clerk has agreed to do that. And I think that gives the residents a lot of capability to vote between, uh, you know, early voting and absentee voting. Um, you know, really, I, I think, you know, voting is, a, is an individual right that we're guaranteed. Uh, and I want to give the residents as much uh, capability as possible to vote. And I really do think between uh, the early voting, which is fantastic, and I think that solves a lot of the problems, and the absentee voting, I think that gives us ample opportunity for every resident to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schneider? Um, I, I, I'll just echo what Mr. Cohane said, that, you know, I have always um, been in favor of having as many options to vote as possible, you know, mail-in included. But after reading Joanne's memo and seeing how much additional work there is on, in her office with very limited resources, um, and, and, and given the fact that we can do early voting, given the fact that you can do absentee voting, um, I don't think that we are putting people at a significant disadvantage by not having mail-in voting. And in fact, we'll, we'll you know, perhaps save the, the town some money by not having to incur these additional costs for all the processing of mail-in votes. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add is that um, it's not like we have a Prop 2.5 override that people are going to be voting on this. There's, as of now, we know of nothing, and there's nothing in the pipeline for, for warrant articles that are, um, that need to have a backup at the ballot. So town meeting will still be there, but we don't have anything where we've got to vote on any of those items. So where it's a one-time thing, I, I think this uh, makes sense. I do think it's important that people vote in the town elections. Um, just because there may not be anything huge on there, these elections are real important. So um, I do encourage everybody to avail themselves of the multiple options that they have to vote and get out to vote. Um, it's very important. So. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of opting out for this one time, and we'll take them as they come. So it sounds like I can entertain a motion. I move that the select board opt out of mail-in voting from the May 2024 town election. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm delighted to second it. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries five zero zero. Um, vote to post the March fifth, twenty twenty four presidential primary election warrant. Yes, sticking with the voting theme, this is a simple one. As the board knows, it has to vote and then sign the president any election warrant. Joanne has provided that. Jackie has it, and we'll make sure you sign it before you leave. But this is for the March fifth, twenty twenty four presidential election. And I would just remind folks again that the deadline to register to vote for that election is February twenty fourth, twenty twenty four and information about where and how to vote is available on tingsboroughmay.gov. Excellent, any questions on this one? Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. With that, I will entertain a motion. I move that the select board approve and post the March 5th, 2024 primary election warrant as presented. I second that. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Carries five zero zero. Commission on Disability Associate Member Appointment. Okay. Take this one. So November of 2023, after a vacancy on the Commission on Disability, uh, our associate member, Ray Ann Jasek, was appointed as a permanent member, and as a result, leaving that associate member position vacant. At our meeting in December, the commission determined that they wanted to broaden their outreach and seek participation from the schools, which we did reach out and we had a tremendous uh, response. In addition, in an effort to make the meetings more accessible to members of the public, the commission did vote to change their meeting time to Monday afternoons at 3.30. As mentioned, the position received significant interest from the community, which has encouraged the commission to review their charge and membership criteria overall. 
So at this point, we are recommending Kathleen Alexandra to serve as associate member. Kathleen is a junior at Tingsboro High School and has a family member with a disability, and she's looking forward to contributing. Questions from the board? There's no issue as far as age or anything like that. The associate member can't vote, so. Okay, just want to make sure. Any the associate member can ask questions and Absolutely. participate, just no voting. Correct. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And then we'll come towards quorum. Excellent. Um, well, I will entertain a motion then. I move that the select board appoint Kathleen Alexander to the Commission on Disability as an associate member effective immediately and for a term to expire next June. Uh, Mr. Chair, I second it. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstain? Carries 500. Moving right along. Planning board, request for comment. 499 Potash Hill Road Site Plan Review. Included in your packet this evening is a request <coughs> for comment from the planning board on site plan review for a parking lot at 499 Potash Hill Road. The select board typically does not make comments on these types of applications in order to allow the planning board the ability to do their diligence, and we recommend the same this evening. The planning board will hold a public meeting on this matter on Thursday, February 15, 2024. Thank you. Anybody feel like we should make comment? Or are we good just carrying on? And no comment at this time? We look forward to next steps when it does come. Okay. 6F, <laughs> ARPA request, dispatch consoles, police department. Do you gentlemen want to come join us? Oh, this Only is good. one? <laughs> Join me. Join me at the table. Are you going to take this? Sure, I can give a quick, um, quick background. Um, so Chief Howe and Deputy Woods are here this evening looking to start the discussion about potentially utilizing ARPA funds to help offset the costs of the dispatch console replacements that were approved by this board and purchased in 2020. Um, at the time, the intent was to utilize PSAP grant to pay for the yearly lease. So far, we've made three of those five payments, including one that was made this fiscal year. And one of the things that became clear quickly um, is that the PSAP grant also helped offset overtime costs in communications. Obviously, with 30 grand, roughly 30 grand going to those lease payments, that's 30 grand less that they could use to, to supplement that. So, um, obviously, they can talk more about the importance of those and how they've utilized the PSAP grant, but just by way of background, the two previous years that we've made the payments, not including this year, in fiscal 2023, we were $55,000 overspent in communications, and in 2022, it was 58. Part of that is due to contractual increases. In all fairness, we gave the dispatchers a new contract that started in fiscal 22, which was very generous. Um, but obviously, you can see that had that 30000 been available to help kind of offset the overtime, which is hard to budget for, that would have made it a little bit less. Um, and for those listening at home, every year we balance the town's general fund budget by using savings from other places, so it's not like we were in some crisis. Um, it's still early, but we expect that will be somewhere below that 50000 but still in that twenty nine, thirty thousand range this year as well. And so I think a great... Uh, this was a hope to start the discussion about how we can hopefully alleviate that moving forward. Like I said, we've already made the payment for fiscal 24, and we still have some time before we have to close our books. Um, but I will now turn it over to these gentlemen who can much better explain. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we receive the PSAP grant every year, and the purpose of it is to support communications. We can use it for personnel cost, deferred personnel cost, as well as equipment costs. So when this came up originally, um, and in fact, I had to look back to see when I wrote the letter, and um, everybody was great. Uh, you know, we, everybody jumped on board, was very supportive. It was right before uh, the American Recovery Act became um, a thing. So, you know, going back, and, and you know I came in front of the board, uh, what, two years ago now, two and a half years ago, for the communications upgrade, the wide-ranging communication upgrade. Really, that act was literally established for projects just like that, uh, communication infrastructure upgrade. This would have fallen into that. So had we had that, I would have recommended at the time that it was paid through, from, through ARPA. 
With that said, at the time, it, it was time is of the essence. We needed to move forward with it. I had, I had a plan, talked to the town. I had concerns, obviously. We're pulling this money. We still have to cover uh, communications. I never know how bad the overtime is going to be. Um, it depends on people being out, et cetera. Uh, we do the best we can. We spread it out the best we can throughout the year. Um, but we needed to get the project done. We did that. We went ahead and we ordered them. So here we are, and to Colin's point, and I will say that a significant amount of that deficit is was contractual. But if you look at that number, 27,000 a year that's going to the lease, me breaking down our deficit right now, I'm literally almost to the penny. I'm within $1,000 of being in a deficit or not right now. Um, so it does play a big role. Um, that is the purpose of it, is the deferred cost. It, every agency has it uh, across the Commonwealth. It works very well. We uh, try to plan out other smaller projects for equipment to save the money for to defer personnel costs. Um, but this was a big one. This was something that we really needed at the time. Our concern was a failure, uh, a catastrophic failure of these communication uh, consoles, which um, were roughly 25 years old uh, at the time we replaced them. So it's also a long-term investment. Those consoles are now a 20 to 25-year investment for the community. So, you know, it, my request in, in speaking to Colin, he's been great about it, very receptive, is at least the last two years to get back, use the upper funding uh, for that. It's a more appropriate um, use of, the, of those funds, and it will allow us uh, flexibility with the budget. So that's where we're at. Deputy, do you want to add anything? I don't know those. That was fun. Okay. I will open up to the board for questions. Anybody want to start? Um, you needed equipment, right? And it's contractual on the other side for the labor costs, so. Uh, I, have a, I have a question, Ms. Gear. It's directed towards Colin. What is the balance now in ARPA funds? Um, un, unallocated is 330000 which is what we've told capital they can spend. My recommended plan before capital would leverage all of the ARPA and less free cash. So, But certainly it's, you know, same thing. We could leverage less ARPA, use ARPA for however much this board feels appropriate on this and then leverage more free cash. Either way, my recommended capital plan is less than what we expected to spend and we were just experiencing the savings by not using as much free cash. But 330,000 remains unallocated. There's roughly 285, 286 um, from project savings, which I'm planning on using for bicentennial, so I'm sorry that's not available. Um, but 330 is unallocated today, ready for appropriation. And to be clear, what we're talking about is, so we've already paid 30 for this fiscal year, and then there's two more fiscal years, so there's another 60 after that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, I mean, so my thoughts on it, you know, ARPA, ARPA is a one-time deal. It was, you know, the federal government gave us, uh, we don't have ARPA, we don't have much left, and we won't have it on an ongoing basis. Um, I look at these things, and whether it's the consoles or whether it's overtime, we've got to figure out how we fit those into our budgets because we won't have ARPA in, in you know, in, in another year. The reality is it'll, we'll spend all of it um, within that period. The other is... Um, Getting it into operating budget, I think, is important because this board can appropriate ARPA money, but town meeting is really the one that should be appropriating all of all the budget. You know, ARPA is kind of a special one. It was it was a different thing. So, I mean, I'd love to see you guys work with Colin to figure out how do we get this into the budget and get it to the point where your overtime is right sized whatever it is you don't some of it you're going to know some of it you don't know i mean the the nature of overtime is you know somebody gets they get injured or they're unable to work and you got to have somebody who fills that shift and that's how you can have some higher numbers on the uh could, on the cost could i just 
add sure. something. So just keep in mind, too, as we're building the budgets, it was, it's anticipated. So we've had, we have this grant, and we have it every year. Uh, it grows roughly 3% a year, 4% a year. Um, but we, we generally know what that's going to be. We've kind of built the, the budgets so we're not fully funded to cover all personnel expenses. It's built in that we're receiving this grant annually. So to your point, if we did that, then the grant could solely go to either all equipment or vast majority of equipment uh, and be an emergency stop for us for personnel. But we also, it's, it's when we can spend it. So at some point during the year, I usually, we get it July 1st, and I hold off until at least January 1st because I want to see what's hit us during the year and what's happened before we, we process it and move forward. What do we need for equipment? What's come up? Uh, personnel costs, are we hit more? Now I have less, fle less flexibility, and essentially with a small amount left, we're using it to just offset whatever personnel costs we can. So yes, we could be better, better budgeted and not anticipate um, a grant, I agree. But it is something that we're going to have every year. So that's something we could build over time. We don't have to do it all in one year to make up that amount. That is something that we could, we could work out and, and, and talk about. I th think that's a really good idea of planning for planning reasons. Yeah, I'm just worried that we're going to be in a situation. You get the grant every year. What happens if we don't? Yeah. You know, I always, I, I worry, love grants, and you guys do a fantastic job of getting grants. But I, I sit there and wonder what, do, I mean, we can't be without consoles. I can't, you know, you can't have uh, the inability to have dispatchers working overtime. So we, we have to, we have to fund those types of things. If I could just say, so this sure. grant, the, un the unique part of this grant, it's actually generated by our 911 calls. So, for example, a few years ago, I don't remember the year, uh, my apologies, but I opted into another phase, which meant, so at one point in, town, in time, because we're on the, on the border, um, and, you know, we have the highway right here, and we're on the Hampshire line, if you were on a cell phone, and you were calling really from anywhere from Tangsboro, not even just close to the line, there was a good chance you were getting either a regional in New Hampshire somewhere, Hillsborough County usually, or it was bouncing to somewhere else uh, in Mass. It's close, it's close to 100% that it's probably going to get now, but now those calls come directly into our PSAP. Every call generated to the local PSAP is money that goes into that PSAP, comes back to that PSAP in the form of this grant money. So. It is true that grants can always, things can always change. This one's a lot less, like, less likely because of how it's structured and because of the mechanism of how it's created in the first place. So there is never a guarantee. I agree with you 100%. This is a little bit more of a unique type grant. So. Thanks, Zach. I know you had a question. You were mm -hmm. I'm just. Go ahead, I? please, and okay, I'll get to you. Okay, so I I'm sorry if I'm, I'm going a little bit back, but I just want to make sure that I understand. So. It says in the memo, right, that the funds to help offset the cost of the dispatch console replacements that were approved by the board and purchased in 2020. So what was purchased? We, we, I think we gave a down payment. My letter is that used, we used 20,000 of it yeah. that year to make a down payment. And then we did a, we did a lease on the remainder of it, a five-year lease. Okay. Yeah. so. Okay, so we started the first payment in 2020, and when do we expect the last payment to be complete? So we have two less. So, so we have two left. So this year, uh, this uh, payment was just made. So we have it's a 27,000 and change. I think it's a little bit under 28,000. Um, so next fiscal and the following fiscal, okay. and then it's paid in full. And then after that, we have a fully paid off console. Correct, both of them. Yep, both consoles. Okay, and was the I don't know if you, if anybody knows this question, but was the overtime this year substantially different or similar to the past couple of years? Just so when we're budgeting, right? So if we made our first payment in 2020, and we now know that this payment is going to have to recur, and we know that there's issues with overtime, right? And budgeting season is coming up. Is there? 
some way we can start to predict what this actually looks like, like a trend, or is it kind of all over we, the place? We can. I mean, th there's, there's certain things we can't tell. We have a dispatcher leave, um, and, you know, it takes us a few months to get somebody ramped up, hire somebody, get somebody ramped up. Uh, we have a hole. But we also have part-time uh, dispatchers, that, and that's kind of the purpose of that. That's where some of this money goes into part-time, but we have to fill those spots. If we go a year that we don't have somebody, you know, that has a, a significant medical issue or something else happens, then sure, we can do better that year. But generally speaking, we, we can put a marker in and we know where we're going to be uh, on a general, um, uh, a general idea of it. With that said, year to year, or at least contract years, um, there's a big change um, that comes when a new contract uh, comes in. So those personnel costs go up, overtime rates go up, shift differentials go up. So there's other ancillary things other than just salary that goes up. That grant, once again, is meant to offset offsets, ends up being a savings to the, to the town um, that we haven't really budgeted for. And maybe we should be doing a better job not counting on the grant to uh, Selectman Eldridge's point um, and properly budgeting this. And I think we don't have to do it in one year. I think that's something we can look at and phase this in over a period of three, four years to get really where we need to be. And then understanding that every time there's a contractual change uh, to their contract, we need to make a proper adjustment so we're adequately funding the, the uh, budget. That was a long answer to a short question, sorry. And, and another challenging part about the overtime um, is that there, there can be, and I know this is certainly a factor in at least one of these fiscal years, individual personnel issues that come up kind of way beyond what we can predict that require the town to expend far more overtime than, um, than you typically would. And this might be very <clears throat> unfair. Is that what happened the past? Because we've been paying yeah, this since 2020. So, I mean, if the, answer, if the answer is yes, the answer is yes. I just don't know. I don't know the timing. For 2020? <clears throat> are talking about what, what year are we talking about? Last it, it, it hasn't happened, yes. Uh, it's not necessarily the reason that these budgets have been off. Uh, it's essentially the significant part is on contractual changes. Those have had a huge impact, and then obviously losing this funding. This funding essentially offsets the need uh, to ask for more more money from the town. Uh, it's it's got us very close year to year when we had it. Now that we've lost it, we have to really kind of things have to go perfect uh, for us not to need all of, every penny of that funding and then some. And keep in mind, we're also trying to maintain staffing and, and all those type of things. And it's still not what everybody wants, but we can't give everybody exactly what they want, and uh, we do the best we can. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that I understand yep. because, you know, we have a letter for context, yeah. so it's, yep. it's better to ask the questions. Okay. All right. That makes sense to me. Thank you so much. Mr. Cohane. So this particular grant is one you received for multiple years, and have you seen any risk of it going away? I haven't, um, and especially the way it's written and it's built out attached, like I said, to those E-901 right. calls. Right. Um, it's a, it's a long-standing grant. Right. So, I, you know, so we haven't heard it's going away. No. Uh, we bought consoles with this particular money based on your recommendation, yeah. right? So yeah. that was your recommendation yeah. that we use these particular funds um, you know, for the consoles. Yep. Um, my biggest concern of this is that, you know, this board uh, has taken um, very conservative budget management uh, practices where we have not used free cash to supplement our budget. I don't believe we've ever used ARPA money, ARPA money to uh, fund our budget. And when I really look at this is that's really where we're going with this. Um, ARPA money, we have been very adamant about using that for capital. Um, as much as possible. Um, there's been a few exceptions, but very few. Um, my concern with the budget is watching so many towns be in a budget crisis right now. Part of that was using free cash to supplement their budget. Um, and when I look at this, um, I look at this as we have a lot of overtime. I believe it's not just the dispatchers, it's police officers also. Um, I guess I didn't realize we had as much of a budget as we did budget deficit as we had last year. 
sounds like we're going to have one this year. Um, you're asking for another $30,000 this year, but you've already been negotiating the budget with the town manager uh, at this point. So what I'd really like to do, um, I think, is for tonight is to ask uh, the police administration and our administration uh, to work together uh, to really look at this in depth the whole budget process, right? So if, if we keep going over, then we need to understand why, what do we need to do differently, um, and just look at the overall budget. And so that would be my recommendation is to work together, uh, table this for tonight. Uh, thank you for bringing it forward to us to understanding the issue that we have in front of us, but it is an issue that I think I don't have enough information to know this would resolve the issue if we just vote on this tonight. It might be much bigger, might be much smaller, but I would like to know that before I take a vote. Can I just make one comment? And I, sure. I don't disagree with any of that and, and whatever you decide to do, but I just want to make the point again that our budget, the, the budget to support our staff take out this grant is artificially deflated because we took into account that we had a grant, that we have this grant, if that grant didn't exist, we would have been looking for that 20, right now, what is now 27 or 30,000 a year. Five years ago, it was 21 or 23,000 and so on and so forth. So it is artificially deflated. Um, we're not spending both, we're literally spending one. We're using that grant to offset something that in any other circumstances, we'd say this need to be budgeted 100%. So. <clears throat> Good clarification ahead. point here. What what I just need clarified, and I think I have this in my head, I just want to say it out loud, is that in 2020, there was a purchase of equipment. I consider equipment capital. Yeah. I don't care if it's ARPA funds or capital asset money. I consider that a capital purchase. It's like a car. It's like this. It's like that. So what we're really haggling over here, in my opinion, is using some ARPA money to cover something that was purchased with money that was part of the um, artificial underflating of the salaries that would normally be reimbursed by this PSAT stuff or PSAP, right? So what I'm really saying is we use money to buy physically something as opposed to paying salaries during that time. So now if we're, if we didn't make those purchases, we wouldn't have this conversation. Yeah, and here's so my, now we want here, to here, use I'll, that I'll money, just say it. Which I think is a good idea to use I, our money. My mistake, yeah. uh, my mistake at the time, what I should have, I should have, recommended my only recommendation would be get it through capital I wanted to get it done I wanted to get it done quickly we had a we had a project that needed to be done I was really concerned about the failure of these we had a couple things happen we had electrical storms Ooh, and rainstorms shutting our consoles down so it was one of those things where I made the decision let's do it the concerns were expressed we had the concerns uh, we talked about it um, with uh, the town administration and we went, we went forward with it, and everybody was supportive. The board was supportive, and I appreciate that. But in any other time, this piece, a piece of equipment like this, two dispatch consoles would absolutely 100% of the time in any community go through capital. Sure. So, so my interpretation is that we did something that's not, we shouldn't have to do that for 25 more years, technically, right? We but bought, two we replaced, years. or yeah, two more years. No, no, I'm, I'm saying to purchase the stuff. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Because these devices should last 15 to 25 years. Correct. Yep. So this is a, to me, it's an anomaly. We got free money from the government, woo, party time, right, all that stuff. But what we're really trying to say is, should we use ARPA money to basically help pay and cover the cost for the next two years so that we don't in, use the PSAP money, which is now can be used for um, salaries or overtime and stuff like that. Yeah. That's really the issue we're talking about. Yes. I think, I think it's a smart idea. And, and to, I think it's important. Um, I think one of the things that you were talking about, um, you had the best intentions, right? You sit there and say, and we run into this, right? You sit there and say, hey, I need some equipment. I'm gonna, I can fund it out of this. Sometimes you, you don't have all the money that you think you're gonna have and costs go up and those types of things happen and so we adjust. We run into this periodically. Um, what I think we ought to do is, uh, I agree with you in that I think we ought to have you guys work together. Because I don't think it's a, all the PSAP funds go to the consoles and all of it goes to um, overtime. I think there's a balance in there and there's PSAP funds. Or, that's just, it sounds like it's a, um, a relatively low risk of going away 
but factor that in with regular operating budget and how we manage the capital. I think it's where we are in that budget cycle. I think it would be good for you guys just figure out, okay, let's look at all of these things. Let's look at what we've got on a, you know, there are going to be some things you can't plan for, no doubt, when it comes to overtime. But there are some things that you can, right? You, you have a ton of experience, you know your people, and you kind of know, yeah, this type of stuff is likely going to happen. Um, I personally would like to see what does that look like within our current budget. I think that there's, we're still figuring out what our revenues are going to be, what free cash is going to be, what some of those things are for our budget moving next year. Now is a good time to do that. And we can still figure out, okay, I just think it's a little premature to just go right to ARPA with this, given we have taken the, the conservative approach to sit there. We talked to finance when, when we got the ARPA money and we said, you know what, we don't want the select board just out giving out the ARPA funds. It, it didn't have the same oversight, doesn't go through town meeting. I think it's important for us to, to be conservative. I'm not saying that, I also don't want to vote and say no on it. I think we should just sit there and say, We've got this issue, we've got a deficit, figure out how we can best manage that deficit and with the grant money that we think is likely to happen and over time that you're gonna have, that we know is gonna happen and let's figure out how we deal with this. Certainly over the next, after this year, there's two more years and then it falls off. So, but there'll be some other piece of equipment that we're gonna have to deal with there as well. So let's, let's just factor that into it and then come back to us and let's see if, if we need to do something that's outside of the, the normal budget cycle. Yeah, we're happy to do that. Sounds like a great plan. Does that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, it works. So I don't think we need, you don't need a vote for that, do you? <laughs> come up with some ways in which we can, we can make sure that we've got the right people, the equipment, and let, let you folks do your job. Good. Sounds okay. like a great plan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Um, looks like we are select board reports. Mr. Schneider, do you want to start? Nothing tonight, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Cohen? Nothing tonight. Um, no, I think it's good. Nothing this evening. Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Colin's going. already said enough for one night. On. Yes, I'm done. Um, there is a snowstorm that looks like it's going to be much smaller. Um, be prepared for it if it does end up being worse than the latest things that are. People be safe on the roads. Let the highway department clear the roads. Uh, Chief, is there a parking ban? Starts. There'll be a parking the ban. The There's likely to be a parking ban, so don't be parking on the streets. Let the people do their jobs and clear everything and be safe out there. Um, and that's it. Our next meeting is the 26th. Um, and we have an executive session, so I will entertain a motion for that. I move that the select board enter into executive session pursuant to exemption three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares DS, DWSD system development fee and road impact fee. Exemption three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares all collective bargaining units and exemption two to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, all non-union positions. Mr. Chair, I, I second that. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Easy person. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. In favor. In favor. In favor. In favor. I am also in favor. That carries 5 0 0. We're going into executive session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Have a good night. Thank Be safe. You. I believe the Board of Health.